Welcome back everyone, I am the Executioner and today we're going to be talking about scarcity and supply and demand. So, scarcity is very much what it sounds like. There's only so much stuff that can go around. And there's only so much of a given resource. So, let's say water, for example. The amount of drinkable water is scarce. Though there, we're surrounded by oceans, uh, th that is not really drinkable water. You would have to desalinate that water. However, drinkable water in, let's say, an island would be considered very scarce, and it would be considered very valuable. Now, let's look at a resource like oil. So, oil is a scarce resource. There's only so much of it, and it can really fluctuate on the price given world events and other things such as policy and laws. Let's say a good, a product, right? There's only so much of a product at a given time. Apple can only make so many iPhones. It cannot make possibly enough to satisfy everyone. They're either going to make too many or they're either going to make too little. And that's the problem firms have been facing for millennium. Now, scarcity is very important here because we have unlimited desires as human beings. They're unlimited desires, but everything is very scarce. There's only so much of it. So, what can possibly help with this process? Supply and demand. So, supply and demand is there's a given demand for a product, right? and there's a given supply of a product. Now, if supply is limited, but demand is high, you're going to see the price of a given product go higher. But if you see the supply of a product be very high, let's say they make more of a product, but the demand is less, then the prices are going to be influenced very much downward. And in an economy, there very much is a point where you could possibly theorize an equilibrium point, where the prices are at sort of an optimal level, that is. But the price mechanism is always changing in accordance with supply and demand. So, uh, practically, you're never going to get a uh, quote-unquote fair price for anything. It's just what the price is at the given moment in the market. Let's look at why transactions take place in the first place. So, transactions are a mutual exchange of goods, be it in relation to money for a product. So, a person is willing to exchange their money for a product because both parties see it as mutually beneficial. The shop owner exchanges his goods because he sees the benefit of the money as more valuable than the goods he departed with, and vice versa with the customer who sees that the product or service is more valuable than the money that he departs to the shopkeeper. Now, there's a myth nowadays in regards to economics where it's called the zero-sum fallacy. Basically, the summary of it is that a customer is giving up his goods for something, but he's not really getting anything in return. One gains at another's expense. The problem is with this is it's very fallacious. It's not considering the benefit that the customer gets from a given product or service. So if somebody buys a fire extinguisher from a shopkeeper, right? then somebody with this mindset would say, oh, he gave his money to the shopkeeper, uh, and the shopkeeper has gained at the expense of the customer. Well, the customer now has something that the shopkeeper doesn't, a fire extinguisher. And that fire extinguisher can be very useful, and it has a lot of utility, and could possibly save the customer's property if it were to catch on fire. So the key thing here is that the customer is seeing the exchange as mutually agreeable. If it weren't mutually agreeable in that the customer thought that he was being taken advantage of, run for a ride, exert 
insert any saying here, then the transaction wouldn't have taken place. The customer wouldn't have parted with his money for the fire extinguisher, and if the store clerk did not think it was beneficial and thought he was being taken for a ride or scammed, then he wouldn't have sold the customer the fire extinguisher. So, in this is a very important concept to understand that these are mutually beneficial exchanges. Now, when do these exchanges not become mutually beneficial? Well, that's when state actors come in to try to control things, try to uh, regulate uh, the actions of, be it the customer or the store clerk, and usually it's under the guise of... Uh, of regulation and protecting the customer, ironically. And so let's say in healthcare, for example, let's say you find a wonderful doctor, you're very much satisfied with his prices, you're very much satisfied with his practice, and you trust him. Now, government comes in and they create a law in regards to healthcare, which regulates how the doctor can act in a certain way, how he can do care, etc. This may seem good on the surface, but let's say a law were to be passed that would limit your insurance company, right, from paying to that doctor. So let's say you live in Connecticut, right, and you see a doctor in Mass. Now you have a healthcare policy in Connecticut. Now, if you wanted to switch over to the Massachusetts policy, that would not be allowed under federal law, even if the Massachusetts policy was cheaper due to competition laws. So that's one way that the state can regulate these sort of things so that it harms the consumer. So in this equation, if you were to have the Connecticut health insurance and you find a doctor in Massachusetts and you want to switch over because the doctor may find that the Massachusetts insurance is way better and he's willing to cut you a break on prices or he accepts that way better. Well, you're SOL if you can't move to Massachusetts. So now supply and demand and scarcity are very interesting fields of study here where supply and demand, for example, that can be influenced by a number of things. It can be influenced by minimum wage laws, which the supply and demand, which in determining wage labor, for example. You're very much putting a price floor on the amount people can be paid. That means it shoves certain people out of the market. This can be observed in the original progressive era philosophers who originally came up with it as a eugenics policy to try to get black and disabled people and women out of the workforce. You could see it in Illiberals by Thomas C. Leonard, FDR's Folly, and a great book on FDR by Burton Falson Jr., where it described very much these regulatory acts as uh, very much putting a stint on supply and demand, and it really keeps these wages artificially high, versus in a free market, these would be naturally fluctuating over time according to supply and demand. So, in terms of economics, scarcity is very important when we, we talk about supply and demand, because a scarce resource in an economy like Let's say gold, for example. So if you have a supply and demand where gold is very scarce, let's say there's only one mine in the world and you have in accordance with supply and demand, well, that's going to be very interesting on the supply and demand scale because people are only going to be able to get their gold from one mine. But if you open up another mine, that expands the supply of gold and actually influences the prices downward and allows for more competitiveness. A great book I would recommend on this is Economics in One Lesson by uh, Harry Hazlitt and a number of lectures by Milton Friedman and uh, David D. Friedman, along with uh, Austrian economists like Woodwick von Mises and Friedrich Hayek. Uh, supply and demand and scarcity are very interesting topics, and it's very important to understand them in the context of not only your everyday life, but in the massive uh, world economy as well. Uh, Ukraine and Russia, for example, is, an, is a great example where when you cut off the supply of oil, let's say from the United States to Russia, right? Let's say Russia sells us oil. Well, if you cut off Russian 
oil, you're going to influence the supply and demand very much in a way that oil prices will go up. Now, some areas may compensate that by that by hiking up their own oil production, but in general, when you create a legislation to prevent the supply of oil, then you're going to see prices of oil go up. You're not going to see them go down. So if Russia produced about 4% of the oil we import in, well, that's 4% lost when you impose a sanction. Now, there will be countries that fill the vacuum of that, but in essence, it's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot. You've just reduced your supply of oil by 4%, and you've influenced the prices on other oil-producing countries. Those will go up as a result. Instead of a free market economy, where if you did not have sanctions, etc., if people weren't liking Russia, what they were doing, then they could buy from a country like, I don't know, Sudan or Nigeria or other countries that may be not as worse as Russia. So it all depends on uh, not only foreign policy, but economic policy as well, is whether you want to go with a very interventionist approach in the economy, which will cost you a lot more than if you were not to intervene and allow the market to decide for itself. So I hope you guys liked that video. Please give it a subscribe. And if you like any of my videos, please check out the remainder as well. If you like this economic series I am doing, please give it a thumbs up and comment down below on what topics you want me to go over next. Have a great week.